So what I hope to do today is, is give you an insight into what goes on within an oil and gas company or within an expert reporting oil and gas values and show you the, both the assumptions we have to make and how we put those assumptions together into a value. So it's very different to a, an analyst's view of an oil and gas company. Uh, we actually have access to all the data so we can actually do a, effectively a bottom-up approach to the, to the valuation. So in terms of um, um, outline, after, after a brief introduction, I'm going to go back into the PRMS guidelines. I'm going to have a look at the guidelines. The PRMS is the Petroleum Resources Management System. It's almost like the, the professional um, guidebook for, um, for petroleum evaluators. And I'm going to go back into there, and we'll have a look to see what they say about the valuation of, of oil and gas. Then I want to actually, Lynn, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with it, talk about what the upstream valuation process is all about. In other words, what are the pieces we need to put together in order to derive a value? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the valuation methodology we're going to apply because it's, it's, it's basically a discounted cash flow method, and I'm going to describe that in some, some detail. And then I'm going to have a look at effectively components of the project net cash flow. Uh, some of it, a lot of you might know some of it, maybe I'm new to some of you. And I'm going to conclude with looking at effectively what are called the, the Valmin code, which is the um, valuation and guidelines that are applied by ASX. And I know they're um, applicable or used quite a lot around the, the, this, this region. So I won't go talk about SEC regulations or COGI regulations in Canada or UK regulations. I'm going to actually sort of go through the, the Valmin code itself. So this is um, a bio-introduction. Uh, it's a slide we used last time. But it's, it's just as applicable to valuations as it is to reserves and resources. And it really sort of highlights why we need to actually standardize both um, our methodology and our reporting. I mean, basically, it's, it's, I'm repeating that slide where effectively it says, boy who makes a million strikes or strikes oil. Okay. And, and effectively, what we're after is, is effectively oil and gas discoveries, or in this case, a big oil discovery. And effectively, you know, the, the margin on oil and gas successes is huge. So there's a lot of interest in finding oil and gas. Those lucky enough to find the oil and gas could be instant millionaires. But for every millionaire, there's a whole lot of people who have lost money. Well, reserves and resource volumes themselves are important, and, and, and companies have to report those reserve volumes and, and, um, it, in, by statutory requirement. But the reserves and resources uh, are important, but they're only important because they're the principal assets of the oil and gas company. So largely, almost all of the revenue that an oil and gas company has, an upstream oil and gas company, is derived from producing its oil and gas reserves and resources. Now, the current company's revenue obviously comes from its reserves. And those of you who listen to the definition of reserves, you know that those are the, the, the barrels of oil or the, or the volumes of gas that are currently in development and in production. The contingent and prospective resources, well, they're, they're going to form the future revenue of the company. Now, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of companies coming to market that have a large proportion of resources and a very small proportion of reserves. Traditionally, it would have been the other way around. Companies came to market, had large reserve bases, and really the resource base was just upside potential for tomorrow. But there's a lot of companies that have, and some of that we've dealt with some companies, that have no reserves at all, and yet have come to market. So we have to actually face up to being able to value contingent and prospective resources. Now, the relationship between volume and value, I hopefully I'm going to demonstrate today, is not simple. There's a lot of people who think it is simple. So they like to take just volumes and convert those them instantly to, to value. And while that might be a rough and ready guide to the value of an oil and gas, gas asset, it's pretty much inaccurate in almost all cases. So it's only a guide. At the end of the day, all oil and gas companies base their decisions on value not barrels. By way of introduction, a little cartoon which, which can apply to the whole oil, upstream oil and gas exploration business is just as well to the valuation process. And I think there's a lot of people who, outside of the industry, just think it is quite simple. In other words, you just go out to sea, drill, find some oil, drill a big hole, and bingo, you're a millionaire. It's not quite that straightforward. So I want to return briefly to the PRMS classification reserve and resources. We use this diagram a lot because it's effectively the underlying key diagram which defines what reserves and resources are all about. And on this diagram, you can see in green, we've highlighted what are called the reserves. Now, the reserves are those barrels of oil or volumes of gas that are discovered and either in development or in production. Beneath those, we got, in gray, we've got what we call contingent resources. 
Those are, the, those are the volumes of hydrocarbons that have been discovered and are yet to be developed. Now, some of them may never get developed, but there's a large proportion that will pass through that gray area and become green eventually. And then beneath that at the bottom, we've got in the, in the blue what we call perspective resources. And those are the volumes that, in our exploration portfolio, they're the yet-to-be-discovered volumes. They're there, the future of the company. Now, the x-axis on that diagram is deliberately there to represent the range of uncertainty. And even if we've got reserves, and even if the reserves are in production, we're never 100% certain how much we're going to produce until the day we've, we effectively abandon the field. So the, re the regulations require us always to report effectively the range of, of volumes. So for reserves, we always report what's called the 1P, 2P, and 3P reserves. And they refer to confidence levels. If you remember last time I was here, I talked about the 90% confidence, a 50% confidence, and a 10% confidence. Beneath that, we have equivalent volumes called 1C, 2C, 3C. These are the similar confidence levels, but apply to discovered volumes and not yet reserves. And beneath these, again, we have what's called low estimate, best estimate, high estimate for perspective resources. Again, these represent our P90, P15, P10 confidence levels of the volumes. Now, volumes don't move up this chart by themselves. So the only way to get something out of the blue and up into gray is to overcome something called the chance of discovery. In other words, you've got to go out and find it. It won't find itself. And to find it, obviously, you're going to have to spend money. You have to drill a well. It's going to take capital. In, the, in an onshore environment, that might be as little as 10 or $20 million to drill. Offshore, some of these deep wells, the ones that we're drilling, say, in deep water out West Africa and the Gulf of Mexico and Brazil, they could be 80, 90, 100 million dollars. And these wells only have a maybe 10% chance of success. So it is big capex, big money. Once they're into gray area and continued resources, then there's still a, a risk to be overcome. And we call that the chance of development. Not all discovered barrels end up being reserves. There are various reasons why some barrels never make it to reserves. And again, the barrels don't just go from gray to the green without doing anything. You have to work at it. And the largely what we might do after discovery is effectively appraise the discovery, try and define in greater detail the volume of oil and gas we've, we have discovered. And there's all the engineering studies to do on the development plan to bring that gas or that oil to the surface. If I look a bit more into PRMS and look for the, where it talks about economics and then economic status, there's, there are more classifications. And unfortunately, many companies don't actually use these classifications, but they're actually quite useful. So if we just look at, say, the, the gray area in particular, you can break down contingent resources in, into three categories, one called development pending. And they're the volumes of oil and gas which are effectively ready to, be, to, be, to start development. There may be some remaining contingencies. That could be environmental approvals, financial approvals, board approvals. But largely, the underlying technical case has been proven. It's technically feasible to be recovered, and it's economic. Underneath that could be volumes that are classed as development and, and, clarif and clarified or on hold. So these ones are effectively in appraisal. We're still working on those. We're not sure yet whether they're going to make it to reserves. Somewhere along the way, some of them will fall by the wayside. And then at the bottom are effectively a larger number of discoveries which become development not viable. So under current prices or current technology, those barrels just are not commercial. You can see on the, on the little diagram to, the, to, to your right, it talks about economic status, and that's um, another category that's rarely used within the PRMS system. People seem to only use the main green, gray, and, and, and blue definitions. And I've just pulled out the, the definitions there. And the reason I've done this is, is it, this is a classic example of, of words that were selected by committee. So they talk about marginal contingent resources, and those are resources which are technically feasible projects and the currently can be demonstrated to be economic or projected to be economic. And the submarginal ones are those which are not economic. The trouble is, the word marginal to me doesn't imply economic and ready to be developed at all. So I think it's actually quite a bad use of English. I'd rather just call them economic contingent resources and non-economic contingent resources. So let's move on to the valuation guidelines. So the valuation reserves within PRMS, the recommendation is we use what's called discounted cash flow methods. Now, those sort of methods are not just applicable to oil and gas. There's lots of 
industries that use discounted cash flow methods. And effectively what we're doing is looking at the, the time value of money. So money today is always worth more than money in the future. Within PRMS, it recommends that you, you can do the, the evaluation in, in, in two ways. One is called using a forecast case, where you're doing everything in what's called nominal dollars. So that's, that's including inflation. Or you can do what's called a constant case. Now, the main reason for doing constant case is really to take out some of the non-technical assumptions that have a big impact on value, like oil price, exchange rate, inflation rate. So if every company has a different forecast for all those, then they can mask the underlying technical values. So a constant case is really useful when you want to compare project A to project B in different companies, because you can take away the, the, you know, the, the, some of those assumptions. But the real value, the value is, is, that you might put on, an, on a property is effectively what you forecast future prices to be. So the forecast case is the one which has great favor. Very few people use the constant case, and that's required to by regulations. When we come to the valuation of the reserves and resources themselves, let's, let's start with the reserves, because they're somewhat the easiest to, to handle. They're, they're the volumes that have been discovered, that are in development, or they're actually in production. Now, the method we use, as I say, is, is a discounted cash flow method. And what we do is we, we, we use the net present value approach. Now, the only thing to re remind you is that because we've reported the volumes over range, because we don't know that with any certainty what the final volume to be produced will be, then the valuation is done over range. It's done over the same 1P, 2P, 3P volumes. So we can not only show you what the range of the, in the barrel terms is, we also show you the range and the value of those barrels. So any company that reports its reserves in a press release and only gives you one number, the first thing you should ask them is, what is the range? Because by the guidelines, I always say, do not express just one number, always give us the range. But it's quite common to see companies just effectively pick either the mean point or even sometimes pick the upside number only and not tell you what the downside is. When we come to resources, what we've got to include is actually not, not just uncertainty, but the risk, the chance of not being there at all. In other words, the chance of getting a dry hole. And the method we use is, as it was fairly standard within the upstream oil and gas sector, is some sort of expected monetary value approach. That's not different. It's still basically the discounted cash flow method, net present value approach, but it's just got risk applied to it. So we still go through the same process of, of valuing the volumes as if we discovered it and apply the risk to it afterwards. So let's look at the valuation process itself. The circles in blue, I've, I've, I've highlighted, I call those the technical assumptions. And the last time we spoke, I spent a long time talking about resource volumes and risks, the two circles at the bottom, to turn those into a meaningful um, set of numbers for a discounted cash flow analysis. And then we have to turn volumes into an annual production profile. So say the discounted cash flow method wants to value um, money today for much higher than money in the future. So we need to actually lay the, that, those reserves out in an annual sense. We then have to actually come together and then decide on, on the development plan. And you could say some what comes first, the production forecasts and the recoverable volumes or the development plan. They all, they all have to be done together because one is a function of the other. So those are the technical assumptions. The non-technical assumptions, I would call them, well, that's how much is it going to cost to, d to develop. Um, on top of that, what the economic assumption is going to be. What price are we going to assume to value those barrels? What's the exchange rate going to be if it's applicable? What's the inflation rate going to be for the costs? And the final piece of the jigsaw is uh, effectively the fiscal terms. Without the fiscal terms, we can't actually determine what the contract or the oil company's take is. So we need those as well. If we, if we work on all of those and effectively bring all those together, we'll produce the, the, the value of, of that oil and gas asset. What we're trying to do here is to show the valuation inputs. You can think of the, the discounted cash flow analysis. It's, it's really looking at um, the revenue on one side against the costs on the other. Now, basically, what we're looking for is, is obviously revenue that's greater than costs. If the revenue is less than the costs to develop the project, you won't need an economist to tell you that's not a very good project. So you need much more revenue than costs. But how much more revenue do you need? And that's effectively the product of the economic analysis. So on the revenue side, as I say, we need recoverable volumes. That's, that's the total volume of, of oil or gas we may produce. 
we need to turn that into an annual production forecast. So how much oil and gas will we produce each year? And by and large, the quicker we can produce it, usually that's the quicker or better economic result. But the volumes themselves don't mean much unless we can actually put a price assumption to it, so that we can turn volume into dollars. As I say, then we need the commercial and fiscal assumptions to know how much of that revenue is going to come to the oil company. It doesn't all belong to the oil and gas company. Most of it belongs to the state, either in the form of direct profit sharing or in a tax and royalty environment through, through factual tax. And finally, if it's undiscovered, we need to assess what the risk might be, what's the chance of actually finding it. Because if it's not there, then there won't be any volumes to value. On the other side of the scales, of course, are the costs. Well, it's obvious we need to know what estimate the finding and development costs are. And once we've found it, that's not the end of the story because we need to estimate what the cost of producing the oil year on year is going to be.